Uh, welcome to the first uh, Physics Matter edition of the year. So as you know, 2022, so is the International Year of Basic Science and Sustainable Development. So it's the perfect years for our colloquia series, Physics for Development. So by uh, all of that, so let's first introduce the member of the FIP panel, so and our guest today. So my name is Christine Daur. I work at European Installation Source in Lund in Sweden, and I'm the chair elected of the FIP, and our chair, Sojo Nimela, who will connect us soon from the ICTP in Trieste. We have with us Luisa Cifarelli from Bologna University, who is the founder of the Physics Matter Series, and the Marilena Logobardi from Switzerland, who is supporting the FIP newsletter. So we have with us today also, so Professor Sonia Radak from Tunis University, who is a colleague and a guest, uh, or a friend or a colleague of our guest today, so Professor Antonio um, de Castro Neto. Uh, so we are, uh, so in 2022, then uh, leading and uh, learning more about technology and innovation. So those are the key for tomorrow's society and the key in mitigating negative impact to our society, like for the environment. So we want more scientific breakthrough for sustainable society. So this series, Physics Matter, has been launched for more than a year now in the middle of the pandemic. So since then, so we have provided 15 exciting colloquia, all recorded and available on our website. So we have explored a broad range of topics ranging from quantum information to forum discussing women scientists in the Middle East, bridging German and the Palestinian education system, or embarking on scientific expedition to the Arctic with polar quest, or even understanding the fluid dynamics of wildfire. So we have also traveled virtually, so in space from Pakistan to Brazil, stopping by Iran, Jordan, Israel, Palestine. And we also travel in time, so returning to the footsteps of Darwin, thanks to paleoanthropology. So, but today we'll go even further and we have adapted our APS schedule to reach our Asian community in order to learn more about the wonder material. So Professor, um, so Castro, uh, Professor Antonio uh, Castro Neto, he's a Brazilian-born theoretical physicist. He's the founder and director of the Center for Advanced Study Material and co-director of the Institute of Functional Intelligent Material at the National University of Singapore. He's a condensed matter theorist known for his work in the theory of metal, magnet, supraconductor, graphene, and two-dimensional material. So he's a distinguished professor at the Department of Material Science and Engineering Physics. He's a professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And he was elected the APS Fellow in 2003 and the, uh, the AAAS in 2011. So he's the member of the Singapore Academy of Science and the Brazilian Academy of Science. And he is also the author of the book Quantum Nature of Material. So for the logistic of this colloquia, so you have uh, um, in your screen, uh, so the possibility to raise your hand or to ask a question, you have a question and answer. Uh, session. So what we can do is to keep uh, those questions for the end, and Professor uh, Nato Castro will be happy then to um, answer those. So then without further ado, so Professor uh, Castro Neto, so the screen is yours. And we... Okay. So um, Christine, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure, an honor to be here talking to you today. Hello to everybody around the world. Uh, and um, today I want to talk to you about something very basic um, in material science, which is uh, dimensionality. And um, I want to show to you that uh, dimensionality is a result of quantum mechanics. So, uh, and that quantum mechanics actually is what shapes everything around us. And um, it also is fundamental uh, for the understanding on how materials behave. And uh, only by understanding how materials behave that we can actually uh, control these materials and get the functionalities 
uh, that we need uh, in order to um, solve the most important problems of our life, uh, of our time. So since I'm talking about quantum mechanics, I think, and, uh, and dimensionality, we have to go back to the beginning. Um, and uh, like everything else uh, in physics, uh, the most interesting things come from a need to explain some physical behavior. And uh, in the beginning uh, of the 20th century, people uh, were dealing with a very amusing problem, uh, which is called the black body radiation. So, um, um, people, the experimentalists had the ways to measure the, the uh, radiance of uh, a black body, and um, they, they, they had a big problem. The way the uh, radiance was behaving uh, as a function of the wavelength of light was at odds with the classical theory. So essentially, in the classical theory, as you reduce uh, uh, the wavelengths, the radiance should grow uh, indefinitely. Instead, what they observe, uh, in, in, and you can see here in, the, in this picture, is that the radiation uh, of, a, of a body actually um, has this maximum, it has this non-monotonic shape. And this was uh, one of the major puzzles of the time. And uh, this was resolved by uh, Max Planck uh, in the uh, exactly 1900, where um, he proposed without really uh, having uh, uh, anything to base, it was an assumption that the, uh, the atoms in the, uh, in the body, uh, they vibrate and they emit light in, uh, in a way that the transitions between vibrational states uh, is uh, quantized. And um, the relation between the energy and the frequency of the light uh, uh, emitted by the body is given by this very simple equation here where he introduced a constant, uh, H, which today is called Planck's constant. He didn't give a name uh, to, to this constant, uh, but this is one of the best measured fundamental constants uh, uh, in, in all science. And it relates the, the frequency of the light with the energy, the transition energy. Uh, this was very early. This was even before quantum mechanics uh, was uh, uh, developed. And at the same time, people found this very amusing and they were studying light emitted by different sources. And one of those uh, uh, problems that people were studying is the spectrum of gases at a certain temperature. And uh, when you get uh, a gas uh, and you pass uh, uh, electricity through the gas, it emits light. Uh, and if you analyze this light, um, you see single lines. You don't see a continuum spectrum as you see in the black body problem, but you see some very discrete lines. And, and this was a, a major problem. And uh, the interesting thing is that there were many, many, many of these lines and people who measured uh, uh, these lines, they, uh, uh, it was associated with uh, a, definite, uh, a certain spectrum. So quantum mechanics comes as a necessity to understand the discrete nature of the emitted light observed in these experiments. And the basis for quantum mechanics is a mathematical object uh, called the wave function that many times we use the Greek letter psi to represent. And uh, it took quite some time since these early experiments for people to actually write down uh, the, the uh, equation that this wave function uh, obeys. And uh, essentially this equation 
is known as the Schrodinger equation. And uh, this is a picture of Schrodinger. And this equation relates uh, energy, kinetic energy, potential energy to the total energy in the system. And the wave function um, uh, has been interpreted in many different ways. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there was lots of discussion. There is still discussion about what it is. Uh, and the canonical uh, interpretation for the wave function is that it's a probability. It measures the probability of finding the electron uh, in an atom at a certain position in space. And uh, the beauty of this equation is that it provides solutions for all these spectral lines, all these transitions between states and the quantization of the energy that was originally proposed by Planck uh, uh, in, you know, many years uh, uh, prior. So, you know, this was of course a major breakthrough because it gave uh, a fundamental understanding of the nature of the, uh, how electrons behave in an atom. Uh, and the Schrodinger equation became a fundamental equation of physics, the same way uh, Newton's equation is the fundamental equation of physics for classical mechanics. But the one interesting feature of this uh, the Schrodinger equation is that the solutions for uh, the wave function uh, have very interesting shape. So this is the shape of the wave function for the different states of the hydrogen atom, which is the simplest atom in the periodic table. So one proton, one electron, nothing else. And when you look at these different wave functions, which represent different states of the electron uh, at different quantized energies, you can clearly see there is geometry here. And the geometry is a necessity, a mathematical necessity of the quantization of energy. And you see these beautiful shapes, which actually in this case, represent different states of angular momentum, which means of rotation of the electron around the nucleus. Uh, so you see that geometry uh, in some sense uh, is born out of these solutions, uh, which is very unexpected in some way, but it comes as a consequence of uh, the quantization rules for the energy uh, in the system, in, the, in, in this case, in the hydrogen atom. So um, when we go from atoms to bigger uh, uh, systems, uh, then uh, we need to think of how atoms interact. And the first in, uh, uh, way that atoms interact uh, is the formation of molecules. I'm going just to mention the case of carbon uh, because it's uh, one of the most interesting because carbon ha uh, has so many different dimensionalities, so many different geometries. So it's, it's an interesting case. So if you look at uh, an atom uh, of carbon, uh, it has six electrons and these electrons, uh, they fill these uh, atomic states and each state actually has two electrons because there is a, a quantum number called spin that's associated with the magnetic moment of the electron. And there is also a, a, a basic uh, rule uh, of nature, uh, which is called the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that for any state, uh, uh, you can only have uh, one electron for, with, uh, uh, for a given set of quantum numbers. In this case, uh, uh, for instance, for each atomic state of the hydrogen atom, I can put the spin of the electron either up or down. And so these are the basic rules to understand uh, uh, how uh, the electrons fill up the different energy levels uh, in the atoms. And, uh, pretty much the whole periodic table can be understood 
on the basis of these rules. Um, but then when you talk about uh, uh, molecules, you um, essentially you, you clearly see that the electrons which are in very uh, low energy states, for instance, in this case, uh, the S state, they are not very reactive because they are buried inside of this uh, structure. They don't react easily. The electrons which are in the surface shell of uh, the electronic cloud are the ones that are actually responsible for formation of chemical bonds. They are the ones that uh, allow the formation of molecules because uh, they, there is a process. Uh, if I have uh, two atoms of carbon nearby, there is an energy barrier that uh, makes them separate. Um, the interaction between uh, 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 these atoms, if they are very far apart, it's very weak because these are neutral objects. So the, the, in the best case you get is a very weak called Van der Waals interaction between them due to dipolar moments and things like that. But quantum mechanics uh, allows electrons actually uh, move from one atom to another uh, through what's called quantum tunneling. So essentially electrons can move through regions which are classically forbidden and uh, atoms can exchange electrons. And this is only possible uh, in quantum mechanics. Classical mechanics would not allow for something like this. So when uh, the uh, atoms interact uh, in a way by exchanging electrons, then they can form what's called hybrid orbitals. Uh, and uh, this is an example of these uh, several different types of orbitals. Uh, and uh, the whole theory of uh, covalent bonding uh, that comes uh, a lot from the work of Pauling essentially tell us that these hybrid orbitals that uh, mix atomic orbitals of different atoms can have different shapes. So again, you can uh, see the geometry starts to play a big role. For instance, you can have linear bonds, so the atoms can couple to each other along a line. And we say these are one dimensional because they, they have only length. Uh, then uh, they can uh, be uh, uh, tri trigonal planar, so the, the bonds form in a plane. So these are two dimensional bonds. And then you can have three dimensional bonds um, in, in a way that you can have tetrahedral, octahedral, et cetera. So, and this, uh, the way these hybrid orbitals form is exactly because of the ge original geometry of the uh, uh, orbitals in the atoms. So here quantum mechanics, uh, uh, again, becomes very important. So not only the, on the geometry of the uh, orbitals in the atoms themselves, but also in the molecular orbitals when these atoms hybridize. So uh, without that, uh, uh, you know, uh, atoms would not form. And uh, when you have uh, 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 lots and lots of atoms, uh, say in a, in a mole of a material, so we have 10 to the 23 atoms there, uh, you can apply essentially the same logic. So, you know, uh, they have atomic orbitals that can hybridize by electrons, actually quantum tunneling from one atom to another over the entire system, right? So you have 10 to the 23 atoms. So you have 10 to the 23 or more electrons. So you have 10 to 23 states of a material, okay? So, and the interesting thing is that because uh, in a crystal, the atoms are very well organized, these, uh, uh, these different atomic states of uh, the atoms actually form a continuum or a quasi-continuum of states, which are labeled by, uh, which are called bands uh, and are labeled by the crystal momentum of 
the, the electron in the crystal. So the bands represent essentially, again, the original, say, atomic uh, orbitals of the atom. And the crystal momentum represents essentially the wavelength of the motion of the electrons in the entire crystal. So uh, this concept of bands and, and so on uh, comes from a, a, a very important work by Bloch who proved that the, the wave function of the electrons in a crystal uh, essentially is periodic in the crystal structure. So essentially you can say that electrons uh, are present over the entire uh, uh, structure of the crystal. They are everywhere. Uh, they have probability of existing in every single atom in the crystal uh, uh, at a point in time. So this is fundamental for uh, understanding materials. Uh, and uh, if you go back to the case of uh, carbon, if I have a material made of carbon, essentially I have these different bands associated with the, these atomic orbitals. And if I look very closely, I look very closely, these states are still quantized, but because I have 10 to 23 electrons, the distance, 10 to 23 uh, atoms, the distance between the states is very, very small, but it's still quantized. And in each atom, due to the Pauli exclusion principle, I can have put a spin up and a spin down states, the state of the, of the electron. So I have a continuum of atoms. I have a continuum of electrons. And as I put, if I could change the number of electrons in the system, uh, I would be changing the occupation of these states, right? So the more electrons I put because of the Pauli exclusion principle, I start to occupy this uh, band crystal momentum states. And uh, uh, from that essentially comes uh, the concept, I'm sorry, am I, ah, okay, of Fermi energy. So Fermi energy uh, has to do with the energy of the less occupied orbital. So uh, in this crystal, so, uh, and of course, this is a concept uh, uh, that uh, uh, bears the name of Enrico Fermi. And uh, the difference of uh, behavior of, of materials can be understood simply on the basis of this. If the Fermi energy uh, sits in the middle of a band, I can easily excite electrons around the Fermi energy. In this case, I have a metal, but if I have the Fermi energy sitting in between two bands of different orbital origin, I have an insulator. So the, uh, the difference uh, between uh, metals and insulators, uh, which are fundamental elements of electronics, of course, uh, for instance, semiconductors, which is the basis of all the electronics that we have uh, uh, is uh, semiconductor based, uh, comes from quantum mechanics, comes from the fact that in certain materials, uh, the Fermi energy sits in the middle of a band and in other materials, it sits in between bands. Uh, and, and so, uh, this is a fundamental understanding uh, that comes only through quantum mechanics. Uh, you cannot understand any of that with classical physics at all. So then, you know, depending on uh, the uh, nature of these bonds, you can have, you know, materials with different geometries. And here, for instance, for the case of carbon, it, this linear structure uh, that we discussed before, uh, can form polymers. Um, uh, if I have this uh, trigonal structure planar, I can get graphene. If I have the trigonal structure, I can get diamond. So out of one element, I can get three different types of materials. And uh, some are metals, some are insulators. 
right? So uh, this uh, combination of materials is what leads to this combination of orbitals and the way electrons move around and the exclusion principle is what leads to this uh, and a uh, huge number of different behaviors that we we'll observe uh, in nature, right? So, uh, but there is something lacking here, which is uh, very important is that we're talking about electrons, but we are not considering the fact that electrons actually carry charge. Electrons are charged objects and they uh, interact very strongly through Coulomb forces. And in nothing that we said here, the Coulomb interaction between electrons uh, is present. So how, uh, how does the Coulomb interaction change this picture? Um, one way to see this uh, is uh, uh, due to Sommerfeld, which essentially postulated that in a metal, the, uh, the electrons move around uh, as if you had a gas. It was a gas that lived inside of the environment of the crystal, right? So essentially they said, I don't care about Coulomb interaction. Coulomb interaction is not important. In a metal, I can think of electrons as moving around. Uh, maybe they don't have the same mass as a electron in vacuum because they are inside of a medium but I can completely disregard the interaction between them. This actually worked extremely well, but it took very, very long time for uh, uh, theorists to understand why this statement is actually true. Because this has to do with the complicated fact that electrons as they move in a crystal, they can screen the Coulomb interaction between themselves. But this took a long, long time to understand. Actually in the very early days of uh, material science, nobody understood that, but Sommerfeld postulated this and it worked pretty well and he could uh, explain, for instance, the electrical behavior in solids. And it was a very successful uh, uh, assumption that he made. However, you know, if you think of uh, 1D material, say this is a, a carbon nanotube where the electrons uh, are moving in a very confined space, essentially they cannot avoid each other. There's no way that they go around and they can screen themselves. And in fact, uh, uh, we know that in one dimension, this uh, uh, picture of free electrons actually fails uh, uh, miserably uh, because of the Coulomb interactions are very, very strong. In two dimensions, uh, like a case of graphene, it uh, sits exactly in between the three-dimensional case and the two-dimensional case, because the electrons can go around, but they cannot move out of the plane of graphene. So it's a little bit like playing billiard balls. Uh, uh, so the electrons, uh, <clears throat> they still can have some degree of freedom, but not a lot. So the question, the question, sorry for that. I don't know what happened here. Let me go back, my computer drop on me. So the question is that what happens, right? Um, uh, people knew about electron-electron interactions uh, in, um, in terms of what's called collective behavior. Um, and um, in one dimension, the constraints of motion uh, uh, is so strong that actually, uh, the only thing you can have is collective behavior. So it's just the case of this pendulum. Uh, everything is collective. And um, these collective modes uh, 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 of electrons in solids, they're called plasmons. Uh, I'm having problems on my side here with my computer. So uh, these plasmons are essentially collective electronic states that uh, essentially uh, uh, reflect this collective motion of electrons against the background of ions in the system. So, uh, man, I'm so sorry about these guys. I'm having some technical issues with my computer here. But essentially, 
the issue is that again, that uh, one dimension and three dimension are very different in terms of these plasma oscillations, right? Uh, in 2D, actually, people have measured these plasmons uh, that we, using this scanning uh, near field optical microscopy, and we see very clearly these plasmons propagating in graphene and uh, many other 2D materials. And we see that they are rather different from the plasmons in 3D materials. So another interesting, uh, so we're talking about metals, but now when you go to uh, uh, insulators or semiconductors, um, then the story is similar. So in a, in a semiconductor, you have uh, one band which is, um, which is uh, filled with electrons and another which is empty. And you can take one electron from the lower band and put on the upper band. In this case, uh, you leave uh, a hole in the lower band, uh, which is essentially the absence of the electron. And you put an electron uh, on the upper, upper band. And these two objects, the positive hole and the electron and the negative electron can form a bound state, just like the hydrogen atom. And these hydrogen atoms actually can have different shapes, just like in the case of the, of the uh, real hydrogen atom. And they can be large, which is called Vanier excitons, or small, like Franco excitons. And these uh, objects actually are responsible for the optical properties of solids, uh, of semiconductors. So they... Uh, the, in two dimensions, uh, if you look at a two-dimensional semiconductor, actually the Coulomb interaction uh, between electrons and holes is very different because the, the uh, electric field can propagate out of the plane of the, the 2D material. And uh, this interaction is so strong that this Sommerfeld model actually fails. And not only that, uh, the hydrogen model for the formation of the excitons fail. So now uh, these days we know that in 2D semiconductors, in order to explain the uh, optical behavior, we have to include many different types of bound states of uh, uh, structures of electrons and holes in order to explain the data. Exactly because this, uh, 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 these ideas for three dimensions actually fail uh, in that case. Um, so the same thing actually happens for magnetic systems. So in magnetic systems, if you have uh, a natural magnet uh, as, uh, and you heat it up, it loses its magnetic order, right? So uh, this magnetic order is essentially because the spins of the electrons can interact with each other through magnetic forces and they can orient. They can be all parallel in the case that we get uh, ferromagnetic material or they can go anti-parallel and then you have anti-ferromagnetic material. And uh, the temperature at which the magnet uh, loses its magnetic order, um, it's, it's called, uh, the, uh, the temperature that happens is called Q heat temperature for ferromagnets and the L temperature for uh, antiferromagnets, right? So again, this is talking about three-dimensional uh, magnets. Uh, we have examples of what's called one-dimensional uh, uh, magnets, and these are molecular chains where you also have these electron spins localized at. And what we know from these chains is actually that they uh, it's very hard to establish uh, magnetic order because uh, the interaction, uh, the, the quantum mechanical fluctuations associated with the ordering of these magnetic spins can be lost very easily. So quantum and thermal uh, uh, fluctuations actually lead to what's called soliton, solitons, which are topological excitations of these magnets. And these solitons can essentially destroy the whole order in a magnet, okay? So this is very, very different from three-dimensional uh, uh, magnets. What about 2D? So 
this is an example of a 2D magnet, a chromium iodine. And this material shows lots and lots of also topological magnetic structures, uh, which are textures, magnetic textures of the spins, which are formed uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the interactions there. Uh, and these are called schemions, interschemions, and things like that. So there is a, a, a whole zoo of uh, topological excitations that can happen uh, in these materials. And so 2D materials are, are neither hard as 3D materials or soft from the point of view of quantum fluctuations as in thermal fluctuations, as uh, the case of 1D materials. It sits in between. And this is exactly why this is so hard to actually describe, because uh, uh, it's, 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 not, uh, it, it's not as it, the, the physical phenomena is uh, much more complex, let's put it this way. So let me, uh, I think I already spoke a lot. I want to get to the conclusions. Uh, so just to, to uh, summarize, right? So dimensionality is a consequence of quantum mechanics, uh, the different uh, structures that we have in materials. But the Coulomb interaction is uh, fundamental to understand why different materials behave in different ways. Uh, if without Coulomb interactions, uh, our materials would look very similar. And we know that's not the case. We know that in three dimensions, this single particle picture works well. It fails terribly in one dimension. And in two, dim in two dimensions, it's still an open problem. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of work that is being done uh, to try to understand what happens in 2D materials. Uh, I think that there is a lot that uh, we will learn in the next few years. And uh, if you want to uh, read a little bit more about this, there is this paper that we published uh, two years ago in Nature Review Physics, where we discuss uh, a lot of this. So with these three young scientists here, and uh, I want with that to thank you for listening to me. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties during the seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. So, Professor Delanito, it's a, it's a very complete explanation about uh, all this phenomenology as well that happened, and that is the, uh, the, the curve of understanding why this is really a wonder material. So, excellent. So, we already have a so few questions that I raised there. So, we really invite you to be able to write them down or raise your hand if you want to speak up as well, so we can allow you to speak live and communicate to make it well, it more like a course, like a face-to-face -face in, in a normal uh, auditorium. Uh, so then we have uh, uh, from Mohamed Asili, so question. So can uh, uh, we say uh, that, uh, oopla, it disappeared. So sorry, so it's there. So can we say that uh, the waves is mathematical object even after the discovery of its topological effect? So that's I'm sorry, what's the question? I will repeat. So can we say that the wave function is mathematical object even after the discovery of its topological effect? The wave function. The, the wave function, <laughs> it's, a, it's a mathematical object. This is my personal view, right? So that allows us to make calculations about properties of atoms and everything else. Um, the, the relationship between the wave function and topology, um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, and how you know, the, the wave function reflects the topological uh, uh, nature of the a macroscopic object, like a magnet or something like this, um, it's, it's very complex as I explain, as I try to explain uh, here, because we're talking about the collective motion of 10 to the 23 particles, right? So um, I think that uh, um, 
I don't have like a very good answer for this. Um, and uh, in, in theoretical physics, uh, one of the arts is essentially to learn uh, to simplify things, right? So we have to, in order to understand things, we always have to make approximations. We have to have effective models and things like this. So that's what we usually do, right? Uh, uh, sometimes we're very successful, sometimes we're not. And it's more interesting when we are not successful, of course. That's how we learn, huh? learning from our mistake as well. So in theory, but experimentally as well, I would say. So we have another question. So from uh, uh, Scott Sauer, so asking, uh, so um, are the Coulomb interaction, the combination of orbitals? Yeah, so the, the Coulomb interaction has to do, the Coulomb interaction is a classical interaction, right? So the, is the interaction between classical charges, right? The, the, the quantum mechanics, you could say, is all in the kinetic energy. It's the kinetic energy, the fact that electrons can move around atoms that uh, makes uh, 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 the whole thing behave in this way, right? So Coulomb interaction alone uh, 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 doesn't do much for you, so in some sense. Very good. So we have uh, another question from, from uh, Moshed Tajad asking and thanking you for your presentation. So can you explain why some materials are high spin ground state? So in fact, some materials are triplet uh, ground state and some are singlet ground state. So why this difference? So, all right. Uh, let me see if I can read this question here. Hold on. Empty on the chat, uh, if you can find it. So you can put, I don't know if the function question and answer is available. You can put your question there too, like this. Report. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can actually read. From the chat, if you look in the chat. Oh, in the chat, okay, let me see. Hold on, ah, okay, so. You see, so thanks for your presentation. Can you explain why some material are high spin ground state? In fact, some materials are triplet ground state. Ah, okay. Uh, why some materials are high spin around ground state? Yes. So this actually has to do uh, with the uh, um, Pauli exclusion principle. So electrons, um, if they have the same spin, they will tend to repel each other because because they don't want to be in the same state. So um, they, they essentially, it, it, will, it minimizes the Coulomb energy. So high spin states are essentially the result of the minimization of the Coulomb, in, uh, Coulomb interaction. So another question from Ikan Zekt. So thank you for the informative talk. So could you please give more insight on why the effective mass fails in 2D materials? It's exactly because of the fact that uh, uh, the, the Coulomb interaction, uh, the, the whole, uh, the effective mass concept works when electrons can screen the Coulomb interaction. Uh, in three dimensions, you have electrons moving everywhere. So the electric field created by an electron essentially is affected by this motion of our electrons around. When you have electrons moving in a plane, the electric field lines come out of the plane and there is just vacuum around. So essentially everything that is out of the plane cannot be screened, okay? So electrons cannot move independently because effective mass means I forget about uh, 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 the interactions. I treat the electrons as if they were independent particles, but with some different mass. So, so effective mass is the effect of the environment. But if the Coulomb interactions are too strong, this concept breaks down. Indeed. So then another question from Shuni Mathieu. 
So could you please explain the orientation of magnetism ordering in 2D, how you compare magnetic moments perpendicular to 2D versus along the plane? Yeah, so again, it's a similar story. If I have a three-dimensional magnet, right? I have, say, a, a, a cubic material. So every atom has neighbors on top and both sides, right? So it has six neighbors, right? And these neighbors interact with each other. And so the interaction is collective and strong. If I have a, a 2D material, I only have four neighbors. I have a square lattice. I have four neighbors. So essentially the interaction uh, uh, is less constrained and that allows the magnet to fluctuate more. So essentially it is an effect of dimensionality. So another question from Sandro Sowa. So also how does the variable that looks like an upset triangle differ from the delta change variable? Well, I don't know what that means. <laughs> So you're not so well, is, is in some it may be in the Schrodinger equation. The upside is uh, is the uh, operator differential operator nabla. Is that what it refers to? I don't know. And I leave if you want to speak up, so Sandra. So I give you I allow you the possibility to speak up. Is it what you were asking? Oh, Did yes, you... sorry. That's what I was asking. When I was reading the equation, I'm not familiar with that variable. So I just wanted to clarify what it meant. What did you it, say the of it is? It's called NABLA. It's the differential operator. Essentially, it's a derivative. So it's, it's a, a derivative? Three... Yeah. So it's yeah. not the same as just change? Yeah, so essentially, it's the derivative with respect to space, variations gotcha. in space. OK, OK, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Very good. So we have a question about the, the material, so more for the logistics. So I had answered this question in the Q&A and I put it back then now. So this is where we will put the slides available on our website. So like this, you can come back indeed to the explanation and you will have as well the recording available there. So this is why this course are so valuable and sustainable as well. So we can uh, ask now the, the question specifically, but uh, I think it's uh, also good to have that. Now we have questions from our panel. So very good. So Maria, Mariana. Uh, yeah, cool. Thank you for your nice talk, Antonio. Uh, could you say a few words about the twisted materials? Do you think that the, these materials will be the material, future materials for electronics? So what are the limitations of these twisted? So, uh, I mean, the, the, the the real limitation, uh, I mean, there is none. I mean, it, you know, from the perspective of electronics alone, you know, it's, uh, you have metals, you have semiconductors, you have superconductors, you have, you have everything that you have in three dimensional materials, right? So in principle, you can build the whole electronics with that. I mean, it, it's clear, right? So, uh, but you know, uh, the, uh, to build an electronics, it means you need materials with extreme crystallinity. You need very uh, 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 pure materials. You need to have very good contacts. You have you need to build the whole electronics period, right? Because the way you engineer the the devices depends on dimensionality. So. It is a problem not of physics, it's a problem of engineering. Let's put it this way. So the, 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 uh, you need to create a new engineering for 2D materials alone. Of course, we don't do this because this is enormous prob uh, problem to solve. We try to do is to include 2D materials in the current technology. So, you know, so an example is that graphene, which is a famous example, is being used in electronics, for instance, for uh, thermal management 
of microchips. Because as you know, now we're, you know, the semiconductor industry is making chips with two nanometers uh, uh, size. And this is around 20, I don't know, 100 atoms, something like this, very small. Uh, and when you pass a current for something so small, you produce an enormous amount of heat. And uh, one of the big, big challenges of uh, 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 these microelectronics or nanoelectronics is how you get rid of all the heat that is produced by these tiny, tiny uh, 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 semiconductor structures. And one solution is to use graphene films because graphene has a very high thermal conductivity and they, it spreads heat anisotropically, which means that you can spread heat in the plane uh, 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 instead of spreading perpendicular to the plane. So you can still do normal electronic design, stacking things with, you know, on top of each other, but then you get rid of the heat laterally. So this is you know, uh, 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 an example for that. So and uh, you know this when we discover new materials and we develop new materials and so on, we don't really expect these materials to replace old materials. That's not the way things happen, right? So they create new applications, like you know, in thermal management in the case of graphene. So I think this is the stage we are in in Thank terms you. of the in technology. And what do you think is the most promising uh, twisted materials at the moment? No, I mean, there, there, is, uh, there are people making a lot of money with graphene already in, okay. in different types of applications, okay? Uh, the, let's say the low hanging fruit uh, is, the, is the use of graphene uh, in composites. So, mm -hmm. you know, not to change electronic properties, but to change structural properties. An example. Um, in metallurgy, um, say there are materials which are very brittle, right? So by, by taking these materials and in, including graphene there, you can make them flexible. Or in polymer physics, uh, similar thing. So uh, you can, uh, most resins, most polymer uh, materials are electrical insulators. You can combine electric resins with graphene to make polymeric conductors. So this is the kind of game that people are playing these days. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have uh, another question also from the audience by uh, Aja Beluva asking, so after thank you for this presentation, so can you explain the differences between quantum materials and nanomaterials? That's an easy one. So could you please explain the difference between quantum materials and nanomaterials? Nine, nanomaterials. So quantum, I think is very clear, right? Uh, what it has to do with the fact that you have quantized energy levels, right? So um, an atom, uh, a molecule is a quantum material by nature, if you want, right? Because uh, they states, of the, the, the system is, are quantized. Um, and um, <clears throat> the, the question is that, where do you see quantum mechanics? My point of view is that any material is quantum, okay? Because as I explained, right? Uh, for you to understand uh, the difference between a metal, a semiconductor, uh, whatever, you need quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is uh, everywhere. Right, and even in a when you have ten to the twenty-three atoms, right? Quantum mechanics is there. It's just that the scale uh, is very, very small. So to me, every material is a quantum material. Uh, but people uh, uh, usually uh, say use this expression, quantum something without a very good definition. Sometimes it's just propaganda, right? But so, uh, you know, I, I, my definition of quantum material is that any material, I would say, is quantum. 
That's a good point. And now looking at going to the limits as well. So the last question uh, from the audience as well by uh, Ivan Aronov, asking uh, so uh, for the smallest dimensionality as well. So you mentioned the 1D. Is there any interest in 0D material? So yes. So I'm wanting a small number. So what do you think? Absolutely. So uh, going back to this issue, molecules are 0D, atoms are 0D, uh, uh, quantum dots of 2D or 3D materials or 1D materials are also 0D. And this, uh, so how do you determine dimension, uh, you know, what's 0, 1D, 2D, 3D? It has to do exactly with the fact that as you get smaller, the distance between energy levels becomes bigger, right? So uh, uh, yeah, so, and quantum dots are used actually quite a lot in medicine as uh, 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 in, uh, to, to uh, tracers for certain chemicals for cancer and, and things like that. So yeah, zero D is also important for sure. Thank you very much. Do we have then any question or comment maybe by Sonia Adad, so from your research as well. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Antonio, for this very uh, reviewing colloquium. So I have a question concerning topology and dimensionality. So do you think that also we can connect uh, topological material to symmet quantum symmetry in and dimensionality? Yeah, so, uh, uh, <clears throat> so top topology has to do with uh, shape, right? So a ball, has a certain topology, a donut has a different topology, right? Uh, and, and, and things like that. So the topology comes from geometry. So it comes from the way, again, the atoms and these orbitals interact with each other. So there is a whole class of what topological uh, uh, materials where the bent structure that I was talking about before uh, has a certain topology with respect to the wave function. So actually it's the wave function that has a specific topology. And uh, this, uh, uh, top, there are topological insulators, there are topological uh, uh, superconductors, there are topological magnets, and all this uh, exactly comes from the quantum mechanical nature of uh, the material we, we we're discussing, right? So it's a, actually a quite a interesting area of research on, on its own. Very good. So from Luisa or Joe, or otherwise I have a question in between. So if, uh, if we look at, so you, you spoke indeed all the theory on all those applications. Now in terms of, we could speak about the application, that's a little uh, part, but then in terms of uh, research as well. So, because this is the important part, like experimentally with, um, with uh, X-ray, with power diffraction, for instance, or with neutron as well, there are quite a lot of field and development there that are, an interesting uh, aspect as well with the, the scanning electron microscopy as well, or with the transmission scanning microscopy. So are you um, involved in those type of experiment or is it some way yeah. where you can expand a little bit and speaking also about the sample, maybe the preparation of the sample is also one part where I guess you, you are directly linked to that. Yeah, so, you know, as I said before about devices, uh, when you are dealing with materials at different dimensionalities, the way you probe these materials becomes very important because, you know, uh, if I have a block of copper, right? I can send, uh, a, say, X-ray and measure the, the properties. But, you know, um, when you're talking about scattering experiments, the intensity, of uh, the, uh, what you measure is proportional to the number of atoms. Thermodynamic measurements is uh, also, the intensity of your measurement is proportional to the total number of atoms. So when you go from 3D to 2D to 1D, 
the number of atoms involved is being greatly reduced. So scattering experiments are very hard to do in 2G and 1D materials, right? Thermodynamic measurements are very difficult to be done in 2G and 1D materials. So for 2D and 1D, uh, we essentially have very small number of uh, 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 experiments that we can use. The, the most used is transport, is electrical transport, right? So you apply a voltage, you measure a current, and, and so you get the resistance, and then you try to understand the behavior of that resistance. But, uh, you know, uh, very in the very early days of 2D materials, you know, we, we essentially told experimentalists, you guys have to invent new ways to probe these systems because, you know, traditional uh, probes that we use in 3D do not work, right? So, uh, uh, and we're still trying to use 3D probes in 2D materials, in 1D materials. And you know, the results are not so, uh, um, uh, how can I say, uh, revealing, because again, uh, uh, the number of probes that we have at, available are very limited. I, I hope that one day, you know, people will develop the whole machinery to characterize lower dimensional materials properly. It has not been done yet, in my view. Indeed, so that's a, a challenge for the, the experimentalist huh, to try to understand how to, to tackle that aspect. Huh? Yeah. And then indeed for the industrialization as well, this is another aspect because there is a world waiting for those delivery and uh, the right. good handling as well of all of that. We had indeed in some earlier presentation, that's a little comment that I thought was interesting to think about the cyborg even. So the evolution about all those ships in terms of 2D now that could as well be used for medical application, for, for a lot of, um, I mean, for the, 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 the salinization as well of the water, from what I understood, right. so a lot of uh, right, capacity, right. a huge demand. So I know that there is as well, financially speaking, quite some fund that has been involved as well in uh, uh, Europe uh, with the European uh, Commission as well. So, and worldwide, I guess that they are as well the same type of um, uh, momentum as well, encouraging for that. So are there um, connections with industry in the case maybe of Asia, because in Asia, the, the dynamism is a bit different. And I think this is why I feel that there is maybe more pushed up on the East uh, than on the West, uh, looking at this uh, application of uh, those 2D materials. Yeah, no, I, I think that, you know, people are doing that. Uh, here at the center, we are doing that too. Um, is uh, just that the, you know the development of applications uh, doesn't come with the same speed as the scientific development, the scientific understanding of these materials, right? Because the <clears throat> the interests involved are very different, and uh, what people are trying to gain is very different. So, but it, uh, to me, I think it's just a question of time. Uh, uh, for uh, these materials make it big in the industry. Indeed, and the multidisciplinarity as well in uh, this uh, research will help so then to have some economists uh, working as well on that could help at the extreme. Yep. Yeah, very good. So we uh, have, let's see, I see that there is one open, no, that's uh, no questions. Are you working on developing graphene oxide membrane to purified water? That's a good question from Eri Bustanat. So are you working on that field for the, the purification of water using graphene oxide membrane? Yeah, we, we are doing a lot of work with membranes. Um, uh, graphene oxide is just one of many materials that we we study for membrane application, for water separation, pervaporation, et cetera. This is of course a big and, and relevant area. Um, and uh, I think that, that, you know, because you can 
essentially easily make membranes out of 2D materials because 2D materials are sort of membrane-like materials. I think uh, this is, for instance, one of the industrial areas where they are going to have a big impact. Indeed, for the environment. Huh? So that's, uh, that's really an important part. Once we can master the challenge of water in the world, that, uh, that would be really good. Uh, yes, yeah, so very good. So I think that we turn uh, just above the hour. So might be good to, to wrap up and uh, unless we have additional questions. So feel free. There is another one so from uh, Skandar Suwa saying, so uh, one am here. Oh, wow. You managed from America to connect. So we are really grateful for that. So he uh, must be back uh, to the chemistry homework. So thank you for the presentation. Fascinating work indeed. So we're really all happy that we connected all, each side of the world indeed, as we mentioned. So this is the, I mean, thanks to the pandemic, there are some advantage. You only have to see the sunny side up, let's say, <laughs> and to make the, the most benefits of uh, all those online and digital world. So next time will even be more digital uh, breakthrough and that will be really the, the future for this uh, sustainable society. Uh, let's make it uh, for the best. And uh, so that you know, we have, uh, uh, so I will just share my screen for the presentation of the next uh, physics matter. So we have one per month and the one in February. So we'll be uh, on a topic uh, uh, which relates as well back to the CSAMI. So you will see, uh, so Professor Kirsi Lorenz so from uh, Cyprus, so speaking about uh, the bioarchaeology. So also some uh, use for the, the metal human health and beyond. So representation will be certainly coupled as well with the forum. And we will have, uh, um, so more of uh, the, um, the, the presentation from the Sesame uh, member country and uh, um, observer country as well in a soon future. So that's uh, also after that we will have in, uh, in uh, March, so from uh, AI, so artificial intelligence, a talk from Lund. So Sweden is also an observer country of uh, the Sesame. So it will be very interesting. So you see quantum computer, artificial intelligence, all the, this uh, future with those material that uh, thanks to light source and neutron source, so I still like to have this uh, little um, uh, advertisement for what uh, we are doing and, and which is really the basics for basic science, so basic science and sustainable development. So this year I think will be um, well paved uh, with uh, the new discovery that uh, our community can uh, bring together as well. So thanks a lot for participating. And uh, so you can find more on our website. So we will put the recording as well online and you should receive it as well automatically for those who registered. Sorry for the Americans uh, for the, those uh, early time, but we're really happy that I've seen that there was more than uh, 150 uh, different uh, person connecting from Asia and I guess as well from, uh, from China as well and from, uh, from Japan. So we are really happy for that. And uh, hope that uh, we'll see you more and learn even more. And we'll stay in contact as well with Professor Castro de Neto and uh, have more information with his book. As it's fascinating and uh, we will uh, learn more and have more questions by email if needed. The email is up there and join the FIP if uh, you can, there are more information as well that you can get there, thanks to the APS to build this uh, welcoming global hub internationally, thanks to the Physical Forum, the Forum of Physics. Bye, everyone. I cut everyone. Bye. Thank you, Antonio. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Wonderful time. Ciao, Joe. Ciao, Lisa. Yeah.